tira ke langa tira tena ko e i fakatau mai a tata we do to in the copa botarana o tira te tihi na ko to te lo pohiri te ro karanga a ko time mai tata ka to a ke tena i piringa fari o tata no re re tena tata ka to so thank you for the introduction it was looked like it was going to be longer than my speech but <laughs> But we've sorted that out, and uh, great to see so many uh, familiar faces here. Actually, I can't see them, but they, uh, <laughs> I wish I could put the names to them as well, but that'll come to me uh, as we go on. So I just uh, wanted to um, acknowledge first of all Dean Tariana, who was the instigator of uh, Whanau Water. Seems like a decade ago, but actually it was in 2009, I think, you began this and in 2010 it was officially launched. So, if it hadn't been uh, for her and for the efforts, uh, I would not have to stand here today. The, um, I'm just going to run through some of the things that are important to Whanau Ora, uh, not to explain the whole history of it, but just to talk a little bit about what it uh, means. And there's only six things you've got to remember. Most people can remember three, Six is a bit of a challenge, but these are the six points that are critical for understanding whānau water. The first is that it is a whānau centred approach, and I'll explain that a, a little. Whānau at the centre, that's the first thing. The second thing is that it's built around whānau water collectives. Te Tihi is one, and there are 30 or so around the country. I'll explain that a bit further. The third point is that it, um, it uses navigators to help people move along a path to success. And the fourth point is that it is one of the very few organisations in the country that is using this commissioning for outcomes approach. It's a bit of a trial for the country and it's, there are likely to be others established uh, later on. And the uh, fifth point is it's about whānau capability, building strong whānau. And the final point is that it's about partnerships between an organisation and other community organisations. So there are the six points. Could leave it there if you like, or <laughs> perhaps explain them a little bit. Just looking at that first one, the whānau-centred approach. Uh, the, the, the point about whānau centred approach is that there is a challenge to providers, social service providers, health providers, education providers, to shift the emphasis from meeting the needs of individuals to supporting the aspirations of whānau. So there's a fundamental shift there in what is meant by a whānau centred approach. Um, most uh, whānau don't live their lives actually in, as being part of sectors or, or being on levels of vulnerability or on levels of deprivation. Uh, whānau live their lives in quite a different world from that and to understand that world is what a whānau centred approach means. It's, uh, what it does require is something which we don't do very well and that is for agencies and sectors and disciplines to be able to work together towards a common agenda. And we're very good in this country at all doing our own things, often doing someone else's thing as well, uh, and not communicating with each other. But this is the, one of the challenges of an integrated approach, that we need to integrate the thinking, not necessarily all the actions and not necessarily uh, fusing groups but working together towards a common agenda. Uh, many services do that already. One of the very first uh, experiences I had with a whānau centred approach was in 1974 or 75 when I was working at uh, Manawaroa which was a psychiatric unit of the Palmsdale Hospital and we established a Fano room so that Fano were admitted as a group into the hospital to work on a particular problem. Uh, it didn't last very long because 
the hospital uh, board thought we should not be paying for parents who weren't patients or for children who weren't patients to be in hospital, uh, but it was an attempt to get a whanau centred approach in an area of health that really was a basic whanau concern. But uh, that, that's one of the challenges then, to look at agencies working together. The challenge is also for the government to get some coordination between health and social services and education and employment and justice to be able to have a common agenda so that rather than each of them having a separate policy for Māori, for example, there is an integrated policy that they work towards. So that's a, a challenge for government. Uh, I, I don't know whether... Uh, uh, government, I think, is finding that very difficult. Uh, to date, certainly with Whānau Water, there have been three agencies that have been able to work together to an extent. Health, social uh, development and uh, Māori affairs. But even that was a challenge because the, each department had its own routine, its own agendas, and establishing a common agenda is a problem for government. It's actually easier to do it in communities than it is to do it in Wellington. But that's uh, what a whānau-centred approach will require, is an inter intersectoral collaboration, interdisciplinary collaboration, uh, where various agencies, including government agencies, can work towards a common agenda. So the second point then, uh, the second key element of Fano Water is about Fano collectives. And there are, I think, about 35 collectives in the country. They're made up, each one of them is made up of a number of organisations, NGOs, who used to work independently. Some of them were working in competition with each other for the same funding. What this required was for those groups to come together, not to fuse their identities, but to work together to a common agenda. So make better use of the resources they had, avoid duplication, avoid um, contradictory advice, because sometimes Fano would have advice from two or three groups that conflicted, so it was quite important to be able to have collectives that could work in harmony. It wasn't easy because some of the collectives had been arguing for 400 years. That's on the East Coast, by the way. Not <laughs> we'd only been arguing for 200 years, but there, but there had been some um, major difficulties. But what they discovered, despite that, was that the whānau they were dealing with usually aligned to two or more groups anyway, and that if they put whānau at the centre, the common agenda was established and they had the capacity to work together. So it worked, it worked re remarkably well and bringing the groups together. Uh, there were some concerns, some concerns were felt that if they worked with another group they would be undermined or that their identity would be lost. And you can understand that. People who have struggled to get their own organisation up underway don't particularly want to see it challenged or undermined or overshadowed by a bigger group. But for the most part, that has worked quite well. Certainly in uh, this area it's worked well. In most other areas it hasn't, but not 100% uh, success there. What it also required is that for someone to put up their hand and say, we will do the organising for the whole group. And that's called the backroom group. Uh, but it certainly needs a backroom group to be able to pull it together. And the uh, other pathway that's been important in this is to have navigators. Uh, they have different names in different parts of the country. But essentially the job of a navigator is to work with a whānau to help the whānau develop its own plan. I mean, most whānau don't have a, don't have a plan. Uh, I would think none of us in the room have, in the past have ever had a plan. If we can get to the end of the week, we're doing pretty good. But to have a plan uh, for the next 10 years or the next 20 years would be a bit of a challenge. 
but it is important to plan ahead and one of the tasks of navigators is to sit down with the Fano, no matter what their circumstances are and to work out a plan for their own development. The plan might be just getting through a crisis in the first point. Once that's stable, then what do we do? And that's been probably the most important part of a navigator is to help the whanau develop its own plan for its own future. Then they uh, often uh, the other task was to help a whanau navigate their way through the myriad of agencies in the community. And if there's a truancy problem, for example, the navigator's job would be to help the family negotiate with the school about re-entry into school, or if that school was the problem, to negotiate entry into another school where that problem wouldn't occur. So the navigator's job is not how can we get this child back to school, but what is the best educational opportunity for this child and how can the whānau work towards that. So that's, that's been an uh, issue. Then the navigator goes one step beyond that and then says to the whānau, so what can we do that all of you, the whole whānau, get involved in some education? Education shouldn't stop when you leave school, it should be lifelong and the navigator's task is to take it to the next level Get the boy, it's usually a boy, get the boy back to school. <laughs> I said that because there's so many women here, I didn't want to. <laughs> thought I'd better get on the right side. <laughs> but to get the boy back to school and then help the whanau develop a plan for their own education in the years ahead. So uh, there's one other point that not all whanau see things the same way. Uh, often have disputes, can't get progress until he gets through a, a dispute. So mediating within the Fano is another role that navigators have to do. That's why they need to be pretty skilled at being able to relate to people in a way that they can help a Fano reach a agreement about a common agenda. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Uh, but constructing pathways to success is, is a uh, really important point. What, is, what does a whānau want to do and what are the steps that they need to follow to be able to get there? The other point is this notion of commissioning for outcomes. Now, most uh, health and social services in this country have been developed outside public institutions through a contracting system where a funder contracts a provider with a whole uh, set of requirements. And that's been uh, the experience here in health and in social services and in justice and in employment where people have contracts to deliver a service. Commissioning for outcomes takes a different <coughs> approach. Rather than worrying about the detailed application and the milestones, it simply says to an organisation, these are the outcomes we want get them and we'll continue to fund you. So it's more concerned with the outcomes than what you do to get the outcomes. And that's what's happened with uh, Whānau Water, is that the overall responsibility for Whānau Water has shifted from the government to two commissioning agencies. Uh, Te Pau Matakana uh, has responsibility for the North Island and uh, Te Pūtahi Tanga o Ngaiwi o Te Wai Paunamu which is made up of nine iwi, I think it's actually eight iwi plus one, uh, they, they, they have responsibility for the whole of the South Island. So these, this is a different approach to delivering services and Fano Order is leading the way in trialling this. My guess is that it will be rolled out in other areas if uh, according to the result that we can get here. So commissioning for outcomes then, a different approach from contracting for services. The Te Pau Matakana's job is to decide what are the best ways of achieving the outcomes for whānau. And it is uh, negotiating that all the time. So it has providers and Te Tihi is one. 
but they're all the time thinking about is that the best way of getting the best possible outcome? And one thing that it means is being able to decide what you mean by a good outcome. Uh, it's hard enough deciding what you need by a good outcome for one person, but when you think the, the intention is not for one person, but what's the outcome for a whānau? And those measurements haven't been perfected yet. Again, whānau water is probably leading the way in looking at outcome measures. Mostly in the past, we haven't asked people w whether they're making a difference or not. There are a number of programs in this country where that question simply isn't asked. But Fano Water from the very beginning has said that we will judge this by the outcome for Fano. Uh, it's a brave stand because as I mentioned those measures aren't that easy to develop but they are being developed. There are other, you may think of other points, the Not OK program for example, you may have, that's been going for a number of years. No one actually knows whether it has made a difference to family violence or not. Uh, with Whānau Water, right from the question, the government's been asking, are you making a difference? Six months after it started, they want to know if we're making a difference. Uh, good question to ask, but uh, that is one of the features of Whānau Water. It's outcome-driven, that its success depends on the outcomes for Whānau. Those outcomes, to a large extent, are determined by the aspirations of Whānau. The um, fifth point in this is about whānau capability. So that whānau water is not about solving a problem, it's about building capability. To build capability you might have to solve a problem, but solving a problem is just a step along the way to building positive capabilities. And these are the capabilities, that uh, these are the outcomes also, that we expect to be able to see with Farnav. First of all, that they'll be enjoying healthy lifestyles. Note the word is enjoying healthy lifestyles, not enduring healthy <laughs> lifestyles, but actually enjoying them. Paleo diet's wonderful. <laughs> they'll have full participation in society, education and the economy, so that they will achieve that, which means they will achieve well at school, they'll be employed and have a good household income and that they will be able to participate in society generally. They will be able to engage confidently in te ao Māori, which means that they will have the skills and the knowledge to be able to do that. Whether engaging with te ao Māori means being on a marae or working with other Māori groups or being part of a kapahaka group, one of the outcomes is that whānau will have no trouble doing that they'll be confident about it. And the fourth one is that they'll be economically secure. There's no great uh, virtue in being poor. Uh, we expect that one of the outcomes here is that whānau will have enough wealth to be able to live a good life. And that uh, they will be uh, cohesive, supportive, and able to talk to each other uh, without raising their voice. <laughs> Uh, that isn't universal for whānau. Uh, some whānau have found that the easiest way to do it actually is uh, on, uh, online, where you don't actually see the facial expressions <laughs> and you can get down to the business easier. But that is one of the outcomes that you'd be seeking, to have a whānau that's cohesive, hold together, can uh, get on with each other and are able to communicate. And then the final one is that whānau will be self-managing. They'll be able to manage themselves. They won't need providers in the, in the future and that they'll be clear about their own aspirations and committed to getting there. So they're the broad outcomes that Te uh, Paumatakana will be translating into indicators so that providers and whānau will be able to know whether or not they are achieving their goals. Whānau capability is the uh, final of the six points and uh, the big focus so far has been on building capability in health and social services. That's not the end point. 
There are other capabilities which are probably equally, if not more important, but are less well developed. For example, economic growth might be an important consideration for a whānau water collective to undertake. And by whānau economic growth, you might expect that they'll be able to advise whānau about home ownership, that's moving beyond social housing to ownership of a home, that they'll be able to help whānau get into business. If a whānau want, <coughs> want to be involved in a the business, there'd be enough expertise within the Whānau Wara Collective to be able to help them navigate in that direction and that they will know how to invest for the future. Skills which, which um, um, many whānau don't have, but financial skills and economic growth will be an important capability for all whānau. Another one will be whānau educational achievement. So that alongside all the other, other areas, being able to advise whānau about educational opportunities and options will be important. The school down the road may not be the best school for their children. And so if, uh, if there is an advisory group within the Whānau Water Collective who are able to give Fano sound advice about what is best for their children. Not every child does well in the same school. And being able to work out, that we're lucky we've got a choice of educational options, but to be able to work out which option is best for which child is something Fano would uh, be helpful with. And whānau themselves will want to be in seminars and uh, getting into educational opportunities for older members of the whānau, similarly important. And there's no reason why a whānau water collective shouldn't have a whānau employment opportunity uh, attached there, where the, uh, people are looking for options for working, for preparing for work, for getting engaged in work, uh, training for work and retraining options if uh, people are, are changing their position. And then the, uh, the final capability, of course, is being able to participate in Te Ao Māori, which means having competence in Te Reo Māori, having knowledge of marae and knowledge of community, and knowledge, importantly, of whenua, of the land. Many whānau have, know that they've got a lot of land, they just don't know where it is, uh, they've heard their grandmother talk about it. She didn't tell them where it was, but she told them there were all that money, all that land along there belongs to you. Didn't add, and 500 other people. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but there is an ignorance, uh, generally, among many whānau about their land ownership title. Yet if people are going to be tangata whenua, if you don't have the whenua, you're only sort of half there. So uh, important that that is seen as one of the tasks also of Whānau Water to link people with the land that they have some entitlement to. So uh, partnerships, that's the final one, is, is the key point. Uh, if we're looking at Whānau wellbeing, there are some obvious partners, PHOs, DHBs, not-for-profit organisations, and perhaps commercial partners as well, need to look beyond the uh, state services. If we're looking at whānau economic growth, the partnership might be with Westpac, who do run uh, similar programs, or with ANZ, or with uh, ASB, uh, but certainly an important uh, consideration would be who is the right group for this whānau water collective to partner with in order to help whānau realise economic uh, advantage. Educational achievement, the partners might come from a wānanga or a polytech university or a group of school collectives and for employment opportunities could be looking at an ITO or, or a uh, tertiary educational institute or a major industry. If there's a major industry that is uh, likely to be a good source of employment they may well be the right partner for a employment training program. And finally, in participation in Te Ao Māori, it may be really important to have an iwi partner, uh, really important to have an iwi partner, or a, a marae which goes into partnership to help with that particular development. 
So that's the uh, the partnerships. Then Farmer Auto Collectors cannot do this on their own. Uh, they've come together as, as a group. They need to be thinking also about partners they can be involved in to help build a capability that's going to be useful to Farmer. And you've seen that slide before, but you probably forgot it. But it's the, it's the six key elements of whānau order. A whānau-centred approach, put whānau at the centre of activities, bypass sectors, work across sectors, not within sectors, across disciplines. Whānau order collectives, groups who come together under the same agenda. Navigators to help pathways, help whānau in the pathways to their own success. Commissioning for outcomes, the emphasis on outcomes. Uh, whānau capability across a whole range of areas and looking for partnerships um, to help with the whānau order uh, aspirations. Talking about our home, land and sea Talking about our home, land and sea Talking about our home, land and sea